All right, let's talk about how John Harvey Kellogg messed up the American diet. Some of you guys may be familiar with him, or well, the name Kellogg should uh, remind you of something called Kellogg Syrup, which he was the eponist founder of that particular cereal company. Let's look at some of his eccentricities. He was quite a weird guy. He was into some really weird stuff. Let's start about a little bit about his background. So Kellogg and his family were Seventh-day Adventists. They had moved to Battle Creek, Michigan back in 1856. Now, Battle Creek in Michigan at the time was kind of the Mecca, you know, the Vatican, if you will, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is where all the, the major religious thought leaders for that particular religion resided. And one person whose name was Ellen G. White, who was a prophetess, you know, she she, she claimed to have heard the word of God and, and, you know, she saw visions. God apparently told her that he didn't want us eating meat. <laughs> and so she uh, took some inspiration from one of the quotes of the Bible, verse 129, and apparently says, and God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you, it shall be for meat. Never mind that the Bible is full of references to eating meat and, and the benefits of eating meat and so on and so forth. There, there are hundreds of other references out there. Some of you biblical scholars can probably allude to that. But, but anyway, she saw that one verse and decided, well, all, all of us should be vegetarian, basically. And so this entire religion was kind of built upon abstinence, you know, abstaining from things, anything pleasurable, whether it's dancing or drinking coffee or pickled food or tea or fried food or spicy condiments or wearing a wig or a tight dress or masturbating or God forbid sex outside of marriage. You know, those things were all completely verboten. Back when John uh, Harvey Kellogg was about 12, 13 years of old, Ellen uh, noticed him and noticed he was seemed to be very, very uh, eager to help and be part of this. And so she offered him a position as one of the church's apprentices. And so by the time he was 16, he was the editor for their health reform magazine. And so they continued to work with him and actually sent him to medical school. And so when he got back, they set up the Battle Creek Sanitarium. So this you know, started out just as initially as kind of a hospital thing, but it then became this luxury uh, grand hotel and spa for where they, they sort of uh, elaborated all their other schemes that happened. And so Kellogg was, was quite you know passionate about his beliefs, but he was also a bit of an inventor and had some very weird ideas and so one of the ideas that he had was that you know he was kind of obsessed with the colon for some reason he felt like you needed to keep it clean at all times and and, and remove impurities from that and so he had several ways to do it and one was something called the vibratory chair and so this was a chair that would shake you around basically shake the poop out of you it also in theory was supposed to help with headaches so basically you would just violently shake until i guess you defecated or something like that here's something that many of you don't know he was one of the first to originally describe and invent something called protose, which was one of the first fake meats. Now, this is before Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger. This is something way back in the day. And so it was a mash of wheat gluten, grains, peanut butter, and he also put iron filings in there to, to, to keep up the iron content. So if you can imagine eating that stuff, it must have been just completely disgusting. Another thing he invented was the, the so-called percussive machine or the percussion mas machine. And the, so this machine was designed to sit there and punch you in the stomach, you know, a little, little robot, mo you know, motorized machine that hits you in the stomach over and over again. And this was supposed to break down the fat and make you to, you know, become thinner. So, you know, people that were a little overweight back in the time would sit there and get their stomach pounded it on. So I guess if nothing else, it would discourage you from being fat because you're like, I don't want to get hit in the stomach over and over again. Now, another thing he was, again, he was well ahead of his time. So you guys have heard of the shake weight, this, this sort of scam dumbbell that they sell, these internet marketers sell you. Well, he basically invented a version of this in 1905. So it was basically for someone who was so afraid of sexual stimulation, didn't want to, he had a lot of vibration devices in there. So I don't know if he had some sort of repressed stuff going on. Now, the last one, which I think is quite funny is he invented the enema machine. Now, apparently, again, like I said, he was obsessed with cleaning out his colon. And so he basically administered himself daily enemas. He said, well, if it's helping me, why not bring it to the public? So he invented this machine that apparently could run through 25 gallons of liquid in and out of your colon within 60 seconds. So that's a, that's a hell of a, <laughs> that's a pretty big flood going on and out there. What he's most famously known for is inventing breakfast cereal. The typical Breakfast in the late 1800s would have been some sort of animal product, maybe it's eggs, some kind of meat, maybe some potatoes fried in lard or something like that. And he felt that that was, that certainly wasn't in keeping with the, the, the religious beliefs and it wasn't in keeping with Ellen G. White's, you know, uh, visions from God that we should all be eating a vegetarian diet. So he felt also that these foods led to increased libido and sexualization and masturbation and lust, and he didn't want that. And so he found that eating bland food 
you know, was, was the key to that. And so he invented cereal. And so he had all these different ways that he tried. And he finally found out that if he could toast, you know, corn and, you know, and wheat and turn them into flakes, that was what he fed people for cereal. And so what it was, it worked. It killed libido. <laughs> so it worked. It did its job. But it was also something that was very inflammatory to the gut. Uh, it was, you know, something that, that you know, obviously drove insulin and glucose up quite well. And so today, even today, there are hundreds of millions of people that start off every day with some version of Kellogg's bland gruel to start their day. Now that starts them off usually in a way in which they're often very hungry afterwards. Uh, it kills their libido most likely. And it sets them up on a path of uh, poor eating habits and so on and so forth. So, so Kellogg's, again, one of the early kind of vegan mindset guys, you know, I think his brain was a little bit addled from, from some of the uh, ideology he was exposed to, has helped to set the narrative for nutrition for the entire you know, 20th century. Uh, with, with some of his stuff. And so, again, for you guys who don't know that, the American Dietetics Association was founded back in 1917 by the same group of people, these Seventh-day Adventists, who again, came into that with this belief that we shouldn't be eating meat. And so, from the very beginning, nutrition science has, has been about kind of promoting plant-based diets, okay? With a religious ideology attached and that still, still very much is present today in case you guys haven't noticed that. So anyway, what I'll tell you to do, skip the breakfast cereal, go eat some steak and eggs and get stronger. We'll see you on the next one. Take care, guys.